to worship. A week of prayer for Christian unity begins on the 18th of January until the 25th of January and churches together in Britain and Ireland have put together a worship resource which takes as its theme Be Longing. I've used some of the resources as a basis of our worship together this morning but I would recommend that if you are able, that you take a look as there are daily Bible readings, reflections, prayers and questions which I trust will challenge us 
as we move on through a new year guided by God. We begin with our call to worship. God is here. The Spirit is with us. How great is this place, for it is the touching place of God. In Christ, we are gathered from the edges and woven into a dream. Here we feel the hint of heaven, where justice, love and mercy meet. Here we celebrate the blessedness of unity in God. We, who were once far off, are brought near. Let us pray. God, creator of all, in your love, you have made each one of us in your grace. You gather us together in your image, in your mercy. You make us restless until we find our rest in you. Disturb us in our contentment. Distract us from our comforts. Deter us from our conflicts until your kingdom comes and your will be done. Amen. Our first hymn is from Singing the Faith, number 570, as we gather, Father Sealers. like to tell us tell you a story now once upon a time 
there was a wall, a big high wall, a wide hollow wall, an ugly wobbly wall. It had been built between two bungalows by two men who didn't know much about building, Mr Chalk and Mr Cheese. They built it red bricks on one side and grey bricks on the other because they hated being neighbours and they hated being neighbours because they were completely different. Mr Chalk was a retired teacher, a book lover who enjoyed playing the violin and doing crosswords. Mr Cheese was a retired chef, a fun lover who enjoyed trying new recipes and throwing parties. Him and his noisy friends, they keep me awake until midnight, Mr Chalk would moan. Him and his pesky violin, he wakes me up at six in the morning, Mr Cheese would groan. The only thing these gentlemen shared was a love of cats. Since moving in, Mr Chalk had taken up with a cat called Wordsworth and Mr Cheese had been taken over by a cat called Kipper. Wordsworth slept most of the time and ate very little, while Kipper, pouncing on shadows, swung on the curtains and ate everything in sight. In other words, they seemed as different as their owners. And then one day, both cats went missing. Mr Chalk realised that Wordsworth had gone first thing in the morning when he wasn't curled up in his usual spot. Mr Cheese realised Kipper had gone later in the day when he didn't appear for lunch. That afternoon, both men headed off in different directions into the countryside to search for their pets. Wordy, 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 Wordsworth, called Mr Chalk. Kippy, 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 kipper, called Mr Cheese. But it was no good. And after a whole afternoon of calling and searching, both men came home empty handed. For once, they actually spoke to each other. Did you see a quiet, sensible cat called Wordsworth while you were out? asked Mr Chalk. No, said Mr Cheese. Did you see a noisy, crazy cat called Kipper? No, growled Mr Chalk. And I hope your naughty cat hasn't led mine into mischief. Not a chance of that, huff Mr Cheese. Your Wordsworth is sad and boring. My kipper wouldn't have anything to do with him. How dare you, shouted Mr Chalk. My Wordsworth is extremely well bred. Not at all the sort of cat to mix with your kipper. Just as things were turning nasty, a desperate mewing filled the air. Meow, meow, meow. The two men spun round. To their surprise, the sound seemed to be coming from inside the wall. Mr Chalk fetched a ladder. He climbed up and examined the wall. Oh dear, he found a broad gap in the stonework. There's a hole, he shouted down to Mr Cheese. Our cats must have fallen through. Even as he spoke, the cats stopped mewing and started to thump about. They're panicking, said Mr Chalk. Or fighting, said Mr Cheese. The thumping got worse. In fact, it sounded as if elephants, not cats, were hurling their bodies against the wall. Before long, cracks had appeared. Mr Chalk hurried down the ladder. No sooner had he reached the ground than rumble, rumble, crash, the wall collapsed. 
as the dust settled, a single marmalade cat stepped out from the rubble, safe and sound. It's Wordsworth, cried Mr Chalk. No, it's not. It's Kipper, cried Mr Cheese. Wordsworth, repeated Mr Chalk. Kipper, insisted Mr Cheese. The cat rubbed around their ankles and the penny dropped. Kipper and Wordsworth were the same cat. Shaking their heads in amazement, the cat's joint owners sat down side by side on the ruins to work out how they'd managed to share the same pet for so long without knowing it. No wonder he wasn't hungry when he came to me in the morning, marvelled Mr Chalk. No wonder he was ready to eat and play when he came to me in the afternoons, grinned Mr Cheese. They talked on. Mr Cheese didn't find Mr Chalk boring, while Mr Chalk was delighted to discover how much Mr Cheese knew. At their feet, a purring kipper, Wordsworth, washed his whiskers. It had been hard work bringing that wall down, but now he was one very happy cat. Let us pray. My neighbours speak with a different accent and live a different lifestyle. They choose different plants for their garden and put different curtains at the window. Because they are different, I build a wall. Maybe not a wall of bricks or fence panels, but a barrier nevertheless. I'm not rude to them and I don't get to but I don't get to know them either. It's not worth it. They're different. We wouldn't have anything in common. People at that other church talk in a different way about faith and organise church life differently. Their building is different and their worship is different. Because they are different, I build a wall. Not a wall of hatred or persecution, but a barrier nevertheless. I'm not rude to them, but I don't get to know them either. It's not worth it. They're different. We wouldn't have anything in common. So he came and proclaim the good news. Peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both alike have access to the Father in one spirit. Amen. We sing again from Singing the Faith number 638 through all the changing scenes of life.
now going to have our Bible reading from Isaiah chapter 49 verses 1 to 7, the servant's mission. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my birth, he has made mention of my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant Israel, in whom I will display my splendour. But I said, I have laboured to no purpose. I have spent my strength in vain and for nothing. Yet what is due to me is in the Lord's hand, and my reward is with God. And now the Lord says, He who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself. For I am honoured in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength. He says, It is too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob, and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. This is what the Lord says, the Redeemer and Holy One of Israel, to him who was despised and abhorred by the nation, to the, rule, to the servants of rulers. Kings will see you and rise up. Princes will see you and bow down because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. On the 22nd of April 1993, a teenager was murdered on the streets of London while waiting for a bus. Stephen Lawrence was a promising young man looking forward to fulfilling his dream of becoming an architect. He was murdered simply because he was black. The murder was to have a seismic effect on society and its reverberations were felt across the four nations of Britain and Ireland. It revealed the ugliness of racism and this was compounded by the systemic failures of the police to bring Stephen's murderers to justice. Following a public inquiry, the Macpherson Report of 1999 brought to wider attention the concept of inter inter institutional racism, the racism that is deeply embedded in society or in institutions. This year, we mark the 30th anniversary of Stephen Lawrence's murder and this will be a major focus for many who work for a society that is free from racism. As long as racism exists, we live in a divided society and a divided world. So during this week of prayer for Christian unity, we reflect upon how these divisions impact our shared life as we pray together for the unity for which Christ, play, Christ prayed. But we also acknowledge how much churches have contributed to division and prejudice within our institutions and also society. As long as there is racism, there will be no Christian unity. They place before us the prophet Isaiah's challenge to do good and seek justice. The prophet is writing to the people of Judah at a time when formal religion is thriving in a culture which understands wealth as blessings from God and poverty 
as punishment, seeking justice and doing good is not on the agenda of either the priests in the temple or the ruling authorities in the neighbouring palace. Isaiah seeks to awaken the conscience of the people to the reality of their situation instead of honouring their religious expressions as a blessing he sees it as a sacrilege. Isaiah denounces the political, social and religious structures which encourage the hypocrisy of offering sacrifices whilst oppressing the poor. He speaks out vigorously against corrupt leaders and in favour of the disadvantage. Isaiah teaches that God requires righteousness and justice from all people all the time in all spheres of life. Our world today mirrors the challenges that Isaiah confronted. Justice, righteousness and unity originate from God's profound love for each of us. They are at the heart of who God is and how God expects us to be with one another. Yet injustice and oppression continue. The sin of racism is evident in practices that set one racial group over and against another. When accompanied or sustained by imbalances of power, racial prejudice moves beyond the individual to take up residence in the structures of society. The prophet Isaiah calls us to learn to do good and requires us to decide to engage with the issues. We are challenged to engage in self-reflection, praying together during this week allows us to reflect on what unites us and enables us to com commit ourselves to confront all instances of oppression and injustice. As Christians, we must be willing to disrupt systems of oppression and advocate for justice. Our commitment to each other requires us to engage in restorative justice. We must speak out, dismantle unjust structures and create a society in which people can live with freedom and dignity. We must engage in dialogue and so increase awareness and insight about the lived experience of all people. Together, we must engage in the struggle for justice in society because we all belong to Christ. Let us pray. Listening God, we need to tell you we feel ashamed of the times when we saw needs and closed our eyes, of the times when we saw miracles and closed our minds of the times we heard weeping and closed our ears, of the times we had, of, had opportunities and closed our hearts. As you turned water into wine, turn our failures into new opportunities, turn our closed fists into open hands to bring your love to our neighbours. Amen. We sing again from Singing the Faith 713, Show Me How to Stand for Justice.
We're now going to hear our reading from Luke, chapter 10, verses 25 to 37, the parable of the Good Samaritan. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbour as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to just himself, justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbour? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he travelled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbour to the man who fell in the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Amen. Last week in our annual covenant service, we once again stood before our God, together with our Christian friends from St Giles, and committed ourselves to be the people that God wishes us to be. We are on a journey with God to make a real difference in our immediate community and further afield. Our lives are full of journeys. There are journeys we make for work, others for duty, some for love and others for adventure. Sometimes the way is easy and filled with companionship, at others it is difficult and lonely. We don't know why the man was going on that long road from Jerusalem to Jericho. We only meet him beaten, robbed and half dead. There appears to be an implicit violence built into our relationships, brought about by the markets that want us to compete against each other or consume products and the diminishing natural resources that we all need to live. Not only does the media inform us, it wants to control and manip manipulate us. We, the consumers, are ourselves consumed. People themselves have become commodities to be trafficked. We are served by a culture of individualism that constantly legitimizes mates the priority of me over others. Of course, in the parable, the man who has been beaten and robbed is not alone. A number of people pass him by and yet, astonishingly, someone did stop, a Samaritan. In doing so, he may well have put himself in danger for this part of the world, he was the outsider, the one who was to be shunned. The Samaritan does not pause to do a risk assessment 
or make a calculation or check to see if he's covered by insurance. His response is immediate and unconditional. He can only see the urgency. A life hangs in the balance. Something else also happens. Whatever form it takes, there is no way describing the sense of isolation and loneliness that violence brings. All the carefully constructed securities that give us a sense of who we are are immediately destroyed. The Samaritan not only tends to the physical wounds, but the deeper wounds into the sense of self. Without even saying a word, he says to the victim, you do have value and you are worthy of care. And if ever there was a doubt, look at how lavish is the care he provides, even looking ahead to his future needs. The parable of the Good Samaritan shows us that our society, our communities and relationships are not permanently broken. We can restore them and it can all begin with reaching out to the other, whoever they are, whatever state they are in. We can decide that we will not let anyone or any circumstances diminish our humanity or the humanity of another person. The story Jesus told shows that the lawyer asked the wrong question. The right question is not who is my neighbour, but to whom can I be a neighbour? Jesus teaches the absolute and unlimited nature of the duty of love. Jesus came to destroy all the barriers. The whole human race is our neighbour. Queen Elizabeth II said in one of her Christmas Day messages, for me as a Christian, when Jesus answers the question, who is my neighbour? The implication drawn by Jesus is clear. Everyone is our neighbour, no matter what race, creed or colour. There are so many hurting people around us. Once we have seen, we should not be like the priest and the Levite and pass by on the other side. The Samaritan took pity and put the man on his own donkey, not the church's donkey. He took care of him and gave him his money. Jesus says at the end of this story, go and do likewise. We need to draw near to the people who are in need, get involved and help them. We are never more like God than when we are helping hurting people, lifting up the fallen and restoring the broken. As Christians, in unity with each other in this church, in unity with other churches in Boulderton, we can make a difference. We can show those around us the human face of God. Let us pray. God for all, we place before you our willing complicity in the evil of racism our ready complacency in the face of injustice, the hardness of our hearts and the heaviness of our souls. Judge us not for these things, but for the manner in which we act to transform the world into the place of your kingdom. Amen. We sing again from Singing the Faith, number 415, The Church of Christ in Every Age.
let us pray. Let us voice our cares and concerns, knowing that God is listening to us. Lord God, make yourself known to the people who come into our churches or who pass by and sometimes wonder but have not yet come in. Make us better bearers of your life to those who need you but have never met you. True and living God, we want to know you more. Lord God, the world lurches from crisis to crisis and there is much misleading and misdirecting. Help us to recover the natural sense of what is right and just, honest and good, so that our hearts are inclined to hear the voice of your leading and respond to it. True and living God, we want to know you more. Lord God, help us to take more seriously our responsibility of helping one another forward into faith as brothers and sisters. We pray for those in our own families whom we would love to bring to know you and for those who have drifted away. True and living God, we want to know you more. Lord God, there are some who are going through very distressing, painful and worrying times. We stand alongside them now and ask for them, for them your comfort, reassurance, healing and peace of mind. True and living God, we want to know you more. Lord God, even as we pray now, there are those journeying through death. We pray for them, for all who have re recently died, and for all those left without their loved ones, grieving or numbed with shock. True and living God, we want to know you more. Lord God, we thank you for all those who have directed us to know you better and for the way you are drawing us closer into friendship with you. We pray that you will accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, and we join together in the family prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. We close our worship this morning for, with number 662 from Singing the Faith. Have you heard God's voice? Have you heard God's voice? Has your heart been stirred? Are you still prepared to follow? Have you made a choice to remain and serve? Though the way be rough and narrow, will you walk the path that will cost you much and embrace the pain and sorrow? Will you trust in one who entrusts to you the disciple? Will you not sit down when the multitudes are silent? Will you make a choice to stand your ground when the crowds are turning violent? Will you walk the path that will cost you much and embrace the pain and sorrow? Will you trust?
God's heart. Will you listen to the voiceless? Will you stop and eat? And when friendships start, will you share your faith with faithless? Will you walk the path that will cost you much and embrace the pain and sorrow? Will you trust in one who entrusts to you the disciples of tomorrow? Will you watch the news with the eyes of faith? Our blessing is based on a Franciscan benediction attributed to the earliest followers of St. Francis. May God bless us with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths and superficial relationships so that we may live deep within our heart. May God bless us with anger at injustice, oppression and exploitation of people so that we may work for justice, freedom and peace. May God bless us with tears to shed for those who suffer pain, rejection, hunger and war, so that we may reach out our hand to comfort them and turn their pain into joy. And may God bless us with enough foolishness to believe that we can make a difference in the world so that we can do what others claim cannot be done to bring justice and kindness to all our children and the poor. Amen. <laughs>